Ready to go? How are we all doing? It's uh, three o'clock, so we're going to get started. The virtual work session in Annapolis City Council for Wednesday, June 17, 2021 will be called to order at 3.01. At this time, would everyone willing and able please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. City Attorney, please present the first item. Um, the first item on the agenda is ID 136 21 Affordable Housing Task Force Report. And we could we could go you first, Sally, if you want, and then do you want to? Because I think the one was back there. I didn't realize as I read through this. So if he's still doing some photocopying. Maybe we can let you guys go first. Is that okay? Yep. All right, then. The first item on the agenda is going to be ID-77-21 Comprehensive Plan Update, Planning and Zoning Director Dr. Nash and Chief of Comprehensive Planner Eric Lashinsky. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us. We will be brief because we are very excited to hear the presentation, but we did want to show you some um, work that we've been doing online that is now available and we're hoping you will share it with your constituents. Eric's going to go through it. Uh oh, no internet. <laughs> I wanted to walk you through, uh, I wanted to walk you through the, the website that we, w we just released with draft goals, metrics, recommendations for the comprehensive plan. Um, that went live yesterday. Um, we're planning to do some outreach over the next few days, and um, let's see if we can get on the internet here. We're getting a millennial up here. Okay, hey, Jeannie, millennial. <laughs> I'm usually reliable for getting on the internet. Um, <laughs> Okay, okay, thank, thank you. you. Hey, that's Just trying to get the internet connection to work. <laughs> you say the word <laughs> millennial and they appear. <laughs> okay. He usually finds the connection right away, doesn't it? We're back. So, in the meantime, I Googled Annapolis Ahead 2040. It came up as the first item. Um, what we've just released is not draft plan. It's the meat of the plan, the draft goals, metrics, recommended actions. It's, um, it's kind of the substance. and. We're at a critical point as we work on the plan document with an anticipated draft release in the early fall. We wanted the community to um, provide input at this stage and give us a sense of whether we're on the right path, uh, check the pulse, and, um, and we've set up a dedicated website to do that. So 
folks come to our Annapolis Ahead 2040 website, they'll see this message that explains where we are in the process, and there'll be a link to our draft goals, metrics, and actions. I'm gonna click on that, and that goes to a website where um, we have an introduction, we explain for folks who may just be joining the process right now and haven't participated yet, we explain, you know, this is a, a process we do every 10 years. It's mandated by the state. It uh, has certain things that we are required to include, and then we, we put our sort of Annapolis stamp on it to make it tailored to our needs here in Annapolis um, and, and come up with a structure that makes sense for our city and where we want it to go in the next tw uh, 10 to 20 years. Um, so on the left sidebar, these are those elements of the comprehensive plan that, that we've determined um, can address both the state's requirements and the things that we think are important to the city um, vision. Um, I can click on any of those. I'll, I'll do that in a sec. Uh, just want to scroll down. Um, we talk about the, the schedule here, where we are in the process. Um, We've, we've released the, the goals, draft goals, metrics, recommendations. We're gonna continue meeting with stakeholders through the summer, uh, civic associations, um, business associations, individuals, um, certainly city council committees, boards and commissions. I'm, I'll be joining the transportation board on Monday night and um, the affordable housing and uh, equitable community development committee uh, on the 24th and any any other boards and commissions will probably be penciled in as well um, and basically can we're going to continue working on the draft comp plan document um, through the summer hoping to release that in the fall so um, I'm just going to scroll down um, the case studies um, I'm not going to go too deeply into this right now but essentially uh, we're focusing on four key areas of the city primary um, uh, these are sites that um, will likely redevelop in the next 10 to 20 years um, we want to try to get ahead of that in some ways and, and identify some strategies that these sites could um, could include to meet community goals and really demonstrate the vision the comprehensive plan so these, we're not going to be providing, you know, conclusive master plans for any of these sites, but just really providing some guidance to, uh, you know, a future developer that might be looking to do something on one of these sites and to understand what the city would be looking for to, to um, so these sites to really respond to community needs and city needs and, and how the city could serve these sites as well. Um, so each of these has... Um, if I were to click on this, it takes me to a website about this site, gives some basic information um, about uh, the area we're talking about, and then, um, looks like it hasn't loaded completely yet. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna actually so, go back for a sec, because the key, um, thing I wanted to share, let's go to the Bay Ridge one. I have to check why that wasn't coming up correctly. Um, the key, uh, this one, there's a survey link that's supposed to be showing at the bottom here. So I need to check on that, but um, it's always something. Um, I'm gonna go back to the main page and talk about the comprehensive plan goals, metrics, and recommendations, and then I'll pass things on to the Affordable Housing Task Force. Um, so if I were to go into any of these elements, I'm gonna click on land use. The first thing folks are gonna see at the top is a submit your comments about land use. That takes you to a comment form, um, pretty straightforward. Um, we've provided some exhibits for each of these elements that just kind of show some of the compelling conditions that we've identified that point us to uh, the goals and recommendations. Um, 
Something for land use, I just want to highlight, I'm not going to go into all of these, but um, an image you may have just seen was for the creek sheds of the city. It's um, something that we realize you know, from getting feedback from folks is that, you know, as the city is going to develop um, over time, we want our land use goals to be in, in um, balance with our environmental goals. And, and came to see that if we think about our small area planning around the creek sheds of the city, that we could not only make help uh, residents of the city become more aware of how their actions, things around them influence the quality of our creeks, how we use those waterways. Uh, basically everything that happens within those creek sheds um, influences the waterways and we know how central water is to our, our economy, identity, culture. So that's just something I'm, I'm excited to, um, to have as kind of a signature thing in the comprehensive plan. Um, but you go down and basically each of the goals of the element are listed here with the metrics and actions. Um, so first one, simplify the zoning code so it's easier to develop infill projects that complement the neighborhoods and creek sheds where they're located. Um, and then the actions follow. And what we're looking for from folks who review these is are we missing anything? Are we aspirational enough? Are we actionable enough? Um, is there something you know, in your neighborhood that needs to be considered here that, that we're missing? Um, and you may have to go through all of the elements to figure out where it's addressed if you're wondering you know, whether a certain park or um, a street that you think is unsafe is you, know, you may have to go to the transportation element um, and look at how we're addressing um, streetscapes and mobility in the city. Um, and so I just encourage folks, um, city council members and, and constituents out there to, to really take some time with this and, um, and, and give it some good thought and, uh, and give us some feedback that we can use to help refine these, um, these goals and recommended actions and metrics. And, um, and I think we'll benefit tremendously from that. So um, that's, that's all I, I wanted to uh, present today. And there are any questions. questions for us? Yeah. Alderman Tooney and Alderman Finlayson. Um, hi, thank you again. Um, boy, no one um, will be able to say you didn't give an opportunity for the public to become engaged. But, but um, where do I, uh, so I direct them to the website and just see, just go through it. What's funny? <laughs> what do we do? I said, oh, they will. <laughs> yeah. No, sorry. Um, um, so I, I direct them to the website, and mm -hmm. then there's, there's headers like that, submit your comments, um, sort of yeah. scattered, or... Every, yeah, each, Every of these, section. each of these eight sections, if you go to any of them, at the very top, they have a, a comment link. Uh, um, oh, okay. That, so we're trying to keep the questions uh, focused on, you know, if somebody goes through the community facilities section, they have a comment about one of the goals there. Um, the idea is to click on that. That's where it goes. And then wow. it goes to yeah. this. For people who have made comments before, this will look familiar. Um, yeah. You know, and we just we just ask them to type in the goal that they're focused on and, and yeah. comments and provide as much information as they're comfortable. Um, and uh, yeah. So it, it looks like you're doing, um, for lack of a better word, kind of these overlays to decide where you're going to do development. Is that a fair statement? Um, yeah. You, you know, governed by looks like environment and and areas that are sort of off limits Can you if I go to the land use I mean that's um, you know the land use section is really a foundational part of the comprehensive plan the I'll, I'll put my cursor on this to keep it I think it should stay still let's see here um, if um, if you look at the draft future land use map, those brown areas are areas that we've identified would be um, ideal for mixed use development. And that doesn't mean to say that those are um, 
the only places that should be redeveloped, but they're places that we think could um, be providing more uh, to the city. So that's one way of thinking about uh, infill redevelopment. It's places uh, that are single use currently. Um, they, they could be having combined uses, retail and residential um, in you know, a compatible way that serves neighborhoods. Um, you know, so. so on, on uh, this might be too um, distilled, but yeah. on the West Street Corridor, for example, yeah. it appears just that the pandemic has taken, um, you know, has had some impact in some of the office space. You see a substantial amount of for lease signs. So mm -hmm. have, is, are you looking at that as possible op you yeah. know, potential in redevelopment, not really right. knowing, but it's just something to put out on the radar. Right. I should have I should have said that the, these brown um, parcels are primarily commercial and office uh, mm -hmm. parts currently zoned for commercial and office. Not all of them. Um, some are currently, um, you know, resident multifamily residential that might have a could accommodate like a small portion of of retail in the future. Um, so that residents don't have to jump in their cars and drive somewhere um, to get for conveniences. But yeah, most of these are office and commercial where um, yeah, the pandemic has definitely highlighted yeah. a need to maybe think about land use differently. So um, just humor me here. I went, I, I only took one class in, in urban design and development and there was this Bible. It was Design with Nature by Ian McCarg. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're mm -hmm. nodding your heads. <laughs> and I just from looking at this, this is this this is absolutely incredible um, effort. I just can't tell you how proud I am of this. <laughs> thanks thanks yeah. for saying that. I mean, one thing we heard in several occasions is a concern that you know, interest in do in encouraging infill redevelopment on parcels that yeah, you know, that People weren't yet convinced that it, they were consistent with environmental goals. I, you know, I think we have to provide um, the document, the appropriate documentation to make that case. But one, you know, I think that um, a point I'd like to make is that, you know, Annapolis is um, is a place that uh, we, we think of it as fully built out, but it's not. You know, I mean, we have a lot of parcels that are. Um, not performing as well as they could be, whether it's environmentally or fiscally or um, the kind of uses they have, whether those are serving neighbors to the best degree they should be. And um, I think it's important to think about, we're trying to get to a place where we understand where those parcels are and, and can, um, um, can incentivize their development. You yeah, know, in a very you know. surgical way. So yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Alderman Finlayson? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my initial question was going to be about housing. Would you mind tapping on the housing link? Not at all. I was just particularly interested in what was yeah. under that category. You know, um, let's see. So a lot of this should align with what you're going to hear after us. And we've coordinated mm -hmm. to some degree with the Affordable Housing Task Force. Um, this slide here, I mean, I just want to stop. Um, oops, let me go back to that. You know, one of the things that we've, this is a, this is a national, um, let's see if I can, <laughs> um, hold on a second here. Um, you know, this is impacting nationally, uh, cities uh, everywhere. This the fact that, um, we have a shortage of, of housing for middle income people. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, I mean, there are significant financial incentive, uh, tax incentives out there for low income housing. We know that high, you know, housing for higher income residents has a significant return. It's that missing middle that is mm -hmm. often not financially uh, lucrative enough for developers and doesn't have any tax credits. So it's, um, it's left out in a lot of places, including Annapolis, and so that's there's a focus here on that. It's not the it's not the only focus, but um, you know it, it's uh, it's important to acknowledge that Annapolis historically has had a lot of 
um, this type of housing. I think of it as light density, you know, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. Um, and over time, our zoning code has made those types of housing more difficult to build in the city. And so um, there is an emphasis on trying to provide more of those types of housing. Um, so when I read through this uh, intimately, will I find a proposal that encourages um, what I would call workforce housing for teachers and our police officers yes. and the like? Yes, very much so. Yeah, okay. there's, there's, there'll be quite a few references there. And um, that's, you know, that's, that's another way of saying sort of middle income population, you know, workforce. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. It, the, the words can sometimes be confusing, but that's, um, that's the intent. Yeah. People, I mean, people making, you know, 80 to 120% of the area median income, or sometimes it goes down to 60%, but essentially they're middle income. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I forgot my other question, so I'll okay. pass. Thank you. Thank you, Olmo. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Um, re relating this missing middle to an earlier slide, I think it was brown areas, which were mm -hmm. the potential redevelopment areas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll be able to figure out where you're thinking these things will go. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Finlayson. I remembered. <laughs> um, in previous comp plans, um, there has been a delineation of, I guess they would call priority areas. Um, that's not the approach that we're taking this time. We're taking a more, I don't want to say global approach, but um, a broader approach. Yeah, I would say um, more, like maybe a little bit more granular thinking about, um, it's not that we can put, you know, hard, guidelines on every property specifically, you know, but we're trying to identify um, those rather than geographic zones that, mm -hmm. you know, where we want to steer. It's more like those properties that um, that aren't performing well or um, are in places where the infrastructure makes sense for a redevelopment. You know, it's um, they're on transit corridors. They um, they're at the gateways to the city or, you know, I mean, where um, it, it sort of the, um, and this, I think we, we owe, you know, the, the public more in the comprehensive plan to explain that kind of methodology, but that's, that's, um, that's going to be a big part of the comprehensive plan is basically making the case for where development is appropriate the, and the kinds of development that we're talking about. So, um, well, unfortunately, we didn't follow uh, the recommendations from uh, the last comp plan with some of our development. So let's, um, I'm looking forward to this approach. So thank you. Gotcha. Thank you. Anybody else? Good work. Thank you very much. All right. Appreciate thank it. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, um, I'm going to just. Uh, remind folks that, you know, again, th this seems like a Russian doll of a uh, website within website within website, but um, it sort of is, but basically on the city's website, if you go to the planning and zoning divisions, there's a comprehensive planning division and that's where you'll find our 2040 comprehensive plan. And, and that's where you'll find the link to our current work. So, or so you we just, just search, it, search it on that, on the city yeah, website. Yeah. And um, I, I will say just keyword city of Annapolis. I'll, I'll give a, um, a shout out to our communications office who um, in rolling out the new, the new website, there's actually a, um, there's like a link right here on the bottom of the, the new main page of the website for the comprehensive plan. So that's the, that's where you can go and, um, and click on 2040 comprehensive plan so oh is there a deadline or anything any we're time? gonna have this the content we just released um we're looking for comments through early august okay so there's yeah you know, again you, you're accurate in saying there's there's a lot of opportunity for participation here so yeah
we're going to keep working as comments come in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. City Attorney, please present next on the agenda. The next item on the agenda is ID 136 21 Affordable Housing Task Force Report. Right, pull up a chair, whoever needs to. Welcome, thank you for all your hard work. Very excited about this. <laughs> yeah, thank you all very much for the opportunity to be with you today. It's nice to see each of you. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to serve as part of the uh, task force work over uh, the last nine months and uh, look forward to presenting briefly on the, our findings. Um, while also uh, providing a sample time to, to have a conversation uh, uh, about uh, the pathway forward. Uh, my name is Elisha Herrig Blaine. I am one of the co-chairs of, uh, of the task force. I'm Eric Smith. I'm the other co-chair. Um, and Quentin, if you want to introduce yourself. Hello all, thank you very much for having us here today. I'm, uh, we're all very excited to, to read out and uh, answer questions on this. My name is Quentin Cummings, and I was the chair of the Needs Assessment Committee. Awesome. Thank you very much, colleagues, for giving us this time to present um, just give me one second. I'll just put together some words um, to share with you all about the task force. Um, so Mr. Mayor and members of the council and staff, I'm pleased to present uh, to you the Housing Affordability Task Force findings. As many of you are aware, this body was scheduled to kick off last April in a ceremony that would have emphasized the importance of housing affordability in the city. Unfortunately, COVID-19 derailed our initial plans. Nevertheless, an outstanding group of nearly 40 volunteers and experts in various fields of housing development joined together to create the foundation to what we believe is the guide to the next phase of housing in the city of Annapolis. I've had the distinct pleasure to work and organize alongside an incredible team and co-chairs Eric Smith and Elijah Herrick Blaine. These two gentlemen have put in countless hours of time into research, relationship building with local developers and community leaders, coordinating documents for a successful transition between subcommittees, and a host of, of other unknown tasks to produce these reports. I would also like to thank Trinity Cook, who serves as the intern to the task force, organizing the initial schedule, documentation, and communication between groups. The chairs of our subcommittees from Feasibility, Katie George, Needs Assessment, Quentin Cummings, and Policy and Recommendations, Melissa Maddox-Evans. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, Paul Christian, who assisted in crucial moments with editing, uh, John Michael, Cecil Cummins, Kimberly Cornett, Chris Along, Nushi Carrera, Laura Gutierrez, Mary Groven, Rich Elliott, Andre Atkins, John Benton, Nancy Lipson, Sherry Hutton, Amanda Campbell, and Sheena Bracca and staff, uh, members of the city of Annapolis who assisted, um, in particular the planning and zoning department. Uh, the commitments made from this body of volunteers was not just important for the sake of gathering facts to highlight the disparities in housing, but vital because it showed the, uh, the constituency that improvements to the quality of life and housing conditions was at the forefront of conversation amongst their elected body. It is no longer a secret of the unjust and often unfathomable living conditions and cost burdens the citizens of the city of Annapolis have faced for decades. And while many of us, while many before us have contributed valuable time and information prior to this task force, we feel these steps will positively impact housing costs, stock, and conditions. As many predicted, one of the most interesting findings of the report was the growth of cost in living in the city of Annapolis. Um, it has grown considerably over the last few decades and has outpaced the income most cities of most city residents. While this does not differ greatly from the norms in cities across the country, but in terms of living uh, uh, costs, Annapolis finds itself closer in comparison to major metropolitan cities rather than comparable cities of its size, which you'll see in the needs assessment report. Personal wealth and income disparities within the city, again, are greater than in most jurisdictions. While there are numerous reasons why this is the case, the negative impacts these disparities add to housing affordability cannot be overstated. 
The lack of access to home ownership or even to find affordable rent contributes significantly, significantly to so many of the underlying neg negative conditions in our communities. The lack of housing and community investment can, direct, can be directly linked to the mass incarceration and increased need for drug, traffic, drug trafficking to create a rental basis. The overwhelming mental crisis contributing to addiction issues in our communities. Not by choice, but due to systemic inequities in housing investment. It is the burden of families like Mrs. Johnson in Ward 6, a single mother of four who despite her best efforts feel she has failed her family. Working two part-time jobs at $12 an hour, she struggles to provide necessities for her family in the idea of, provi uh, idea of providing her family with a better quality of life and a, home of a dream, uh, and a home is a dream constantly vanishing. She, like so many, feel the system constructed to assist her has inevitably failed her family. I know that it is just important to some of you as it is to me to both physically and literally rebuild the trust in their community so that the most necessity in a clean and safe living environment is granted to the families across the city. Some may say the ideas are far-fetched, time-consuming, or redundant. But as my grandmother used to say, the devil is in the details. And so as we dive into this report, you will find inequities continue to grow, and particularly amongst minority communities who have suffered through decades of mismanagement and lack of investment. In closing, again, I want to stress the importance of safe, secure home or residence. In 1943, Abraham Maslow introduced a paper titled A Theory of Human Motivation in the Psychological Review Journal, an, an annual journal that produces psychological theory articles. In this document, he introduced the concept of Ma Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The study was used to describe the pattern through which human motivation generally moves. His hierarchy of needs was split into five concepts psychological, safety, belonging and love, esteem and self-actualization. Those into three categories, basic needs, psychological and self-fulfillment. The idea being that for motivation to arise at the next stage, each stage must be generally completed for satisfaction within the individual to progress. At the core of this concept is shelter. Without a positive community and home experience, the individual has effectively lost self-worthiness and the desire to move ahead. In our 10-point plan, we will analyze the data and supporting evidence on what we believe will be an effective way to revitalize, reimagine, and invest in the future of families in the city of Annapolis. Again, thank you for sharing this time with us. Um, I just want to briefly go through how we structured this task force, and I'll pass it off to my co-chair, Elijah. Uh, we split up into four subcommittees. The first being needs assessment so that we could actually analyze raw data and see what needs we could draw from said data in the city of Annapolis. Um, that further influenced policies and recommendations subcommittee, which then influenced the feasibility subcommittee where we then analyzed the feasibility of said policies and recommendations. And that concluded with the public engagement committee. Um, and their work is still ongoing as we speak. And Elijah will take you through the 10 point plan and we'll field any questions that you may have at the end. Thank you. Let him know the 10 point plan is in the back of the exam. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Alderman Gay, for your leadership in, in paneling this task force. And uh, so on the executive summary in front of you on page six, you will find the uh, 10 point plan. So I'll direct your attention uh, there. What you are seeing on your screen is the needs assessment report. Uh, as Eric outlined, uh, we had a needs assessment uh, subcommittee, a policy and recommendations subcommittee, and a feasibility subcommittee. Um, the uh, policy and recommendations merged into the, the feasibility. So you will find three overall reports from the task force, an executive summary, and then the needs assessment. The needs assessment is not physically here with us because of, of, of the size. So that is what you're seeing on the screen. And then you'll see the combined policy and recommendations feasibility committee report uh, accompanying the executive summary uh, physically with you today. Um, I again point you to page six of the executive summary where you see the 10 points and I'm gonna be uh, discussing predominantly three of the, uh, I'm sorry, seven of them. 
not to minimize uh, the three that I won't be focusing on, but I do want to spend some explicit time uh, tying the seven together, and I think that you'll find uh, that they have been underscored by what was just presented uh, by city staff uh, as part of the consolidated plan. So I I'm going to talk about items number one, three, four, six, seven, nine as one part, and then 10 independently. So starting with items, item number one, the housing authority uh, of, of the city uh, has, long, uh, has long been viewed as a separate entity in and of itself detached from, uh, from the city's overall planning process. And I think that is one of the primary things that we want to really encourage a, a, a psychological break around is that the city uh, needs to really fold in the housing authority in a much more intentional way, particularly given the condition of the of public, public housing stock and obviously given the, man, the judicial mandate that the city now finds itself facing. Uh, the uh, item number three is a mechanism by which upon folding in the housing uh, authority more intentionally uh, will allow for um, uh, the repurposing of not only public housing, but also of a lot of the other uh, land that was discussed as being available to the city for, for development, and that is through uh, enhancing the current affordable housing trust fund. Uh, number four, you did hear uh, Eric and Dr. Nash also uh, underscore the need to re-examine city code, look at rezoning opportunities, particularly as we begin this recovery from the pandemic and the reuse of a lot of land that is uh, transforming as a result of the economic uh, changes that the pandemic has forced upon all of us. Uh, then coming into number six, this is where, and number six and number seven uh, are particular sources of federal uh, support that really need to be intentionally uh, tied into, and that is the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative and also the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, both of which are through uh, HUD. And th this, in order for these funds to be fully leveraged and, and, and employed throughout the city as, as uh, best as possible, there does need to be an intentional effort by the city to show that support, to bring in additional partners. There are opportunities with the Anne Arundel Medical Center. We had some conversations as a task force with them about how to fold in possible Medicaid or Medicare dollars to uh, provide supportive services. This is a model that has been done in Baltimore with the support of the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development and is a great pathway forward. And I strongly encourage the city to look at that as a revenue source to free up those dollars that might initially go to supportive services those could be filled with Medicaid and Medicare dollars, thereby freeing up some of that capital to go over to the operating side in order to put shovels in ground and actually build up structures. Finally, uh, in number nine, there is the, talk, uh, there is the uh, mention of establishing a, a city land trust uh, to support uh, housing affordability overall. Uh, the land trust is a, another central component to this. You will see as a, a, a central element of our uh, recommendation is, uh, is putting in a right of first refusal and allowing there to be a right of first refusal and having the opportunities for nonprofits and other uh, developers committed to uh, boosting the, the amount of housing that is affordable um, uh, to residents uh, enables there to be a prioritization around these parcels that are available. And so we need to have a repository that allows for that right of first refusal to place those parcels and to then allow that, those uh, entities dedicated uh, to uh, uh, housing affordability to have access to them in a manner that, uh, that allows them to leverage the partnerships that are out there. Mm. Um, so I wanted to, to just take a step back for, for a second because that's one, three, four, six, seven, and nine. And as I mentioned, those are, those are all in one. And I think for me, as I kind of think about all of this, when I look at, at connecting all of those pieces in together, 
we're seeing now the, uh, the consolidated plan come online. And we just heard actually uh, Alder, Alderwoman Finlayson mention that unfortunately the city did not take the recommendations out of the last consolidated plan as robustly as perhaps the city could have. And I, what I found myself thinking is, uh, in preparing for, for my time with you all today was, you know, you all have come and you've had city staff and, and you all have impaneled a, a, a group of concerned citizens to come together and offer recommendations. And I hope what you all are seeing is that our recommendations are, are really in line with one another. We are collectively coming to you all and outlining predominantly the same form of recommendations. Really what is, uh, is, is missing is action on the part of the city. We need that action. And Alderwoman Finlayson uh, mentioned that lack of action last time, and I truly and sincerely hope we do not miss this opportunity uh, this time to act in face of the judicial mandate, in face of the outcomes of, of COVID-19, and it cannot, uh, uh, this conversation cannot happen without mentioning very intentionally the role of the racial reckoning conversation that the nation is having right now. You cannot have a conversation about housing without talking about the intentional racist policies that have created the environment that we are now facing. And these policies have taken place over multiple decades. This is not gonna be solved overnight we need to have equally intentional policies that are anti-racist to push and push back on the decades of racist policies that created this environment. And to that end, I then draw our attention to number 10, and that is the implementation of rent increases. Rent increases were prevented as a result of COVID-19. The city did not fall apart. These rent increases are able to be capped. We have examples out of the state of Oregon where you can cap rent increases at 7% plus the cost of living. These are modest suggestions. These are not extreme suggestions. We are simply asking for the profit margin to not be excessive. And that is the most immediate way that we can have an impact for the largest number of people in the city. Items one through nine, they have a timeline that is more in the medium. But if we wanna have a more immediate impact, we must consider the implementation and the extension of, those rent of, those, of the rent control that is currently in place. Um, I'll leave it there, and I thank you all again for the opportunity. And colleagues, I just wanted to add, if it may seem that some of these recommendations, as I mentioned, are redundant, and that was done purposefully. We worked very, very close, as I mentioned, uh, with Hackham, Melissa Maddox-Evans, the CEO, and making sure, in particular, that um, recommendation number six, the CNI Neighborhood Grants, and seven, uh, HUD's rental assistance demonstration was included, because that is a priority to her, and she felt that it should be a priority of the cities, which we have made strides uh, uh, to do so, in particular with the CNI grant um, and Sally Nash's department uh, have been uh, meeting frequently with HACA to um, you know, follow through with that process. We as a council just passed a resolution permitting $32,000 to assist in that program. Um, and so uh, some may seem redundant, but it was done that way purposefully to, again, just stress the importance. Alderman Annette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A uh, couple of questions, please. Um, this isn't the big report. Do we get the big, complete report? So you, so you, oh, you receive the um, needs assessment report, which is 87 page uh, okay. pages, I think, in um, January or February. Um, and okay, I sent so it to you again uh, via no, no, email no, today. I, I did print that out. Okay, just yeah. one, that's, that is okay. Yeah, and so um, I just was trying to save some trees. It was 1,055 pages if I printed enough for everybody. Um, and so uh, the needs assessment is in um, email form, and, and I sent it uh, both today and, and last February. So on the, on the last point, because that's really a rent control of no more than 10% a year. I mean, that's, do we have data? I mean, are rents increasing faster than that now? So I'll direct your attention to the needs assessment report, and I also will direct your attention to the executive summary. Page two of the executive summary will show that since 1960, rents have increased at a rate two times of income. I'm sorry, it's page three. 
In, in Annapolis, we're talking about. No, I'm talking nationwide overall. But within Annapolis, that trend line is is uh, is 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 also true. Okay. Uh, I'll also uh, welcome any input from uh, from Quentin Cummings, who chaired the Needs Assessment Committee and was a significant contributor uh, from the data perspective. Yeah. Any uh, any data, Quentin is more than prepared to answer. So. Okay. Thank you. Sure, and just to, to if you go to the next page right there, and uh, this this chart here that was put together, um, I do want to make sure that people understand the way this is is worked out, right? So essentially, you've got a numerator and a denominator. We're talking about the median income and the median sale of a, of a structure in this uh, residential structure within this town. And so what we see when we look back is that Annapolis used to be further. Uh, up on this chart, up being that it was more affordable. And then over time, the affordability of this town is getting lesser and lesser affordable. So what we are doing here is the, it's essentially the median sale price of a residential unit divided by the median uh, income of a family. And so when you look at this and you see that, yes, we are less affordable than Washington DC, our neighbor down the street, we are less affordable in this town than many uh, cities throughout the country, and that's all cities. Now, when you compare Annapolis to cities of like size, cities of like makeup in terms of uh, racial makeup or makeup in terms of near coastal, uh, Annapolis is coming out well above our, our peers in terms of that it's less affordable. And so it is important to, to ensure, and I know that the, the needs assessment report is a very long report, but we wanted to ensure all the details were there for you all to review. Uh, and if you have any questions, we are available even beyond today. Okay, so further question, um, and I looked at the very first uh, 10 point plan, um, and my immediate question, and I think this is why you said some of the action has to be here at the council, um, do we have the authority to reimagine HACA? Isn't that a federal program? So the council has already um, taken steps in the recent budget um, to help with what we uh, consider reimagining uh, the housing authority and creating a more efficient relationship. We just passed um, in the budget uh, dollars to hire a HACA liaison, uh, which we believe would be critical um, in the implementation of just opening up communications again um, as it relates to one, the affordability, uh, two, the stock, and then three, the conditions of the housing um, on Hakka properties. So I guess I was misconstruing, reimagining. Uh, right now, public housing is big blocks of monolithic structures. I, when I think of reimagining, I think of uh, mixed income and dispersed, uh, a whole different kind of uh, housing, and I think HUD is actually kind of moving that way with the vouchers and the RAD program and that sort of thing. You're not, you're, you're talking about, it feels to me like what you just said, Alderman Gay, is reimagining the relationship between the city and the housing authority. Like with the, uh, our support for the, uh, uh, pro the uh, what's the program, Choice Neighborhood that, program. That is, that is true, but um, I'll allow, um, um, the, my colleagues to expand on uh, what you mentioned as well in number seven, eight, and, and particularly six as well, which focus more on development um, and accessing the dollars necessary uh, to take the next uh, step forward in development. Um, and so I'll allow my colleagues to just expand on, um, in particular, the low income housing tax credit and uh, the. And these um, are all in the more detailed report, right? Yes, sir. The, these thoughts. Thank you. And also, if you look at the. Uh, Executive, I'm sorry, and also if you look at the executive summary uh, in detail, we've uh, laid out some steps for uh, the 10-point plan. Okay, thank you. I believe you were hitting the nail on the head with the idea of reimagining public housing, or for the sake of this conversation, we'll say affordable housing. And from you know monolithic structures to similar to what my colleague, Mr. Lashinsky, presented today. There's duplexes, there's various forms of development that we're looking to employ here. And that you'll see is addressed in bullet point four. So that's the city code bullet point. And when we think of reimagining HACA as a leader of a city housing council serving all citizens, 
We envision similar to what's occurring in Montgomery County with HOC and how they are considered the affordable housing developer because within their toolbox they have, you know, um, attractive low interest rate bond financing. They have a hefty line of credit that they can exercise the right of first refusal on and you'll also see some language regarding the right of first refusal within this report. And if you want me to elaborate on what that means, I'd, I'd be more than happy to. But there are certain tools that public offices and, and housing authorities have that private developers don't that make once, um, I guess, income burdened developments possible. And that's what we envision when we think of reimagining Hakka as the leader of a city housing council. Just being the city's affordable housing developer. That's public-private partnerships, that's, that's everything that falls under that title. So that's a perfect segue to my last question, which is, where's the money? Where's the money gonna come from? Uh, public-private partnerships, it's obviously it's coming from the private partnership. They get incentives, they get tax credits and things like that. Do you think that's the primary a source of change is those kinds of, because uh, Haka's already looking into those things with the RAD program. Is that really the way forward? It's definitely one of the routes forward, um, but another route, there, there are, developments can be done without actually using LIHTC funds, and that's using the value of the underlying asset and refinancing it and putting your own equity into it. And subsequently, you can still bring in a, a private partner, and that lowers the cost and allows you to do mixed income developments where the market rate units offset the operations of the property, and the property is no longer as reliant on subsidies as 100% affordable property would be. So there are multiple routes, and that's a great question, and I'd love to interface with you further. And we can hypothesize and, and find many different routes and these are conversations that i'm having with melissa currently um but you're right that is one route but there are multiple others okay so that i, I actually do have two more questions i want to talk about the land trust but uh it seems to me you're right you're bringing it to us and there are things that the council can and should be involved in um is that going to happen and i'll ask alderman gay this uh, through your committee, Duan, or is it going to be a larger work, work group like this, so, which uh, I would suggest? What, what we are hoping after this, as required by the resolution um, that we passed last February, uh, that within 30 days the council take um, action on the recommendations. Um, and so we would hope to put together uh, a, 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 some piece of legislation working alongside the housing and community development um, or which is now Housing and Community Equity Development uh, Committee, uh, which is chaired by uh, yeah. Kathy Ebner um, and managed by uh, Teresa Wellman. Um, and so what that body is uh, put together to do is, one, follow through with the recommendations of the task force, and two, also uh, uh, the recommendations of the uh, consent decree. And so um, they've already been meeting um, and uh, they're, they're rocking and rolling. And if you'd like to uh, further explanation, um, Teresa could explain a little further if you'd like. Okay, well, yeah, well, it's up to my colleagues. I would, but uh, I can get that independently if nobody else is interested. Not seeing people chomping at the bit. I, you know, I think there's a lot of detail. I agree with you. This is not something we can do in a work session. We really do have to have more intense discussion, more information. Um, the, the land trust, I'm not sure I quite comprehend what that has. I'm, I'm thinking of two spots in the city right now. One of them is the Spa Road uh, area, which certainly is city property that could be devoted. The other one, and it's something Alderwoman Finlayson and I are kind of excited about, I think, is the uh, Rocky Gorge potential, which is a public-private uh, partnership, but I, I'm having a hard time understanding exactly the mechanisms that we would go through to establish and what would actually be in a land trust. 
So I think one of, uh, well, I'll jump in at the end because I think what I, yeah, what I want to bring is. is so the, the overarching mechanism, Melissa Maddox uh, Evans was involved with this down in, in, in um, Charleston, I believe it was. Um, the overall mechanism is that it is a legal entity that allows for the transfer of properties, the deed of the property, to go and be assigned within the land trust, and thereby, got somebody that's very excited about land trusts. <laughs> They're in favor. They're very excited about land trusts. Um, and I, I will be the first to acknowledge that I am not the preeminent scholar on land trusts, but the, the overall ability, uh, the overall uh, concept is to be able to transfer the legal and ownership rights into the land trust to allow it to be there while the stacking up, as, as we've been talking about, the money that goes into these types of projects needs to come from a variety of sources. And that takes a lot of time. And so in that time, we want to be able to ensure that the property doesn't go anywhere that it remains committed to housing affordability. And so the, the, the land trust is a legal vehicle by which we can hold on to those parcels of land to ensure that they are dedicated to the use of housing affordability while the other pro, uh, efforts come together to bring in those varying layering subsidies. And I do wanna also go back to your overarching question of where is the money? And one of the things that it's not exclusively an appropriation that we're asking for from the city of general funds. You know, there is the capability to tie in municipal bonds. There's the bonding capability. There's the ability to, for you all to partner with the county and do a joint municipal type of bond. That type of example is out there in national examples with a city county partnership. Similarly with the, with the state with a city, county, state partnership around that bonding. But then also it's in bringing in by working with partners like DHCD and, and other state entities around the use of Medicaid and Medicare dollars, as I mentioned, as they've done up in Baltimore. And then finally, we've got the, the uh, medical center who has expressed a lot of interest in having conversations about how they can develop workforce housing as well. So I think there are a variety of avenues that have not been fully explored that would really unlock a lot of capital for these types of deals. But going back to- And, and just to add to that really quickly, Ross, um, as Eric mentioned earlier, right or first refusal, um, and which is something that the city has uh, tried to practice. Uh, I, I believe um, the older woman just you know, uh, alerted me to some uh, previous attempts, and I think the uh, the idea is that um, to participate in right of first refusal, you, you have to have the capital necessary to do so. Um, and so, even just looking at like nonprofit organizations uh, that focus in housing development and giving them the opportunity to step in for right of first refusal to secure land uh, for development in the future, um, I think that could go a long way. And we have some great um, nonprofit organizations that focus in that work in our city. Um, and so there, there are several, um, you know, opportunities to really uh, just jump in and preserve the existing space that we have. Okay, well, that's exactly what I'm trying to understand. Uh, securing the land. Um, we know, as Eric just told us, we're a, pretty much a built-out environment. That doesn't mean we've optimized the buildings, but it does mean they're there. So it's, it's not like there's vacant land around or big tracks. Um, this almost harkens back to an old urban renewal concept where you're buying tracts of houses or getting commitments on tracts of houses, um, putting together a parcel. Um, is that what, I mean, because that's really kind of an outmoded concept now, isn't it? I don't know if I'd go so far as to say it's an outmoded concept. I do. I would say that it, there has been evolutions in the way that it's been utilized, and I think that's the the overarching point that we're trying to make is that the the modalities that are currently in play within the city of addressing this issue have clearly not not met the need. Uh, you, you, know, we, you know we just took all of that legislation out of our code, right? I, and I recognize that, that there are some, some ongoing efforts to, to create that evolution. I think what we're coming to you all and saying is that there is not going to be a single way 
you know, that is going to solve all of this. This has got to, this is a very complicated issue and it's got to be responded to with, with a, a multifaceted answer as well. One of, and, and so if you kind of track that out, we've got to look at just as you're talking about, we've got to look at a variety of methodologies for addressing land use. We've got to look at a variety of modalities for how to address the financing. And, 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 and all down the line there, and, and the affordability aspects. Um, I do want to um, turn it over to, to Quentin real quick, as he had an observation from uh, that's uh, offered in the executive summary. Yeah, thank you very much. And so, yeah, on page five of the executive summary here, you'll note uh, that it was previously posted up there that, yes, the city, the city does have uh, a situation where it is mostly built out. Uh, but I do want to point out that when examining the tax assessor records that we actually have almost 500 acres um, or correction 500 parcels within the city of Annapolis that are uh, either vacant or null within the tax assessed record for parcels um, so almost 500 and they, they account for uh, about 176 uh, acres total so okay because I I know we have a lot of vacant parcels because I was looking at to say we're not getting any tax dollars for that. Sure. Uh, but most of them were small or landlocked. Yeah. So, uh, so how many of them are really viable? So what I would want to say here is just, just like it was pointed out, there is no silver bullet, right? This is multifaceted. Um, not saying that all of the parcels are ideal parcels, but the, of these parcels, they are, they are already zoned residential, right? So of the parcels that are mentioned here, I'm not just pulling vacant parcels, pulling vacant parcels, that are also zoned residential already and so they account for almost 500 um, parcels that account for about 176 acres so just as it was pointed out in, a, in prior testimony um, that this is one part of it and then the fact is that we are also not maximizing potential of of the uh, parcels that are developed on already so this is kind of intriguing because in my block there on my side of the street there is a parcel that is almost big enough to be buildable certainly could have an accessory dwelling unit but it's landlocked and there would be a lot of code changes that would have to be uh, gone through to make that viable sure so thank you for pointing that out that is um, something that I can take back and do an analysis of uh, and find out which ones are locked landlocked as you mentioned uh, and by landlocked you don't actually mean landlocked you mean that they They're don't not, have accessibility to the road or something like exactly. this. Exactly. Yes. No accessibility okay. to the street. So what I can do in the analysis, so I'm a GIS uh, professional, and I can do an analysis here and find out which ones have access mm -hmm. to the road, and okay. then cut that out and come back with another number Look in the you. 500 block of 6th Street. <laughs> Just on that, I think that's, you know, that is exactly kind of the, the varying modalities that we're talking about, from identifying these parcels that could be used for denser development, but all the way down to ADUs, as you're mentioning, and the use of tiny homes and developing, developing these lots uh, in, in varying manners that also can be done in a way that have a, a daisy chain effect, if you will, that it's prioritized for affordability, it's set aside into the, into the, into the trust, and then as it's brought out of the trust, it may initially be used for tiny homes that can lay some of that existing sewer line um, and, and, and then be daisy chained into other types of development that are maintained in affordability as, a, as time goes on. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you entertaining my questions. Thank you. Uh, Alwyn Cerny was next, then Alwyn Pindell Charles. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You, you don't know how refreshing it, it was to hear you speak so passionately about two major issues in the city. Um, one of them was my reason for deleting the urban renewal code, um, just because I think of that as our original sin, if you will. And you spoke very clearly how that has damaged us, as well as um, not ignoring the racial undertone and the not in my backyard that's out there and I, I really I really appreciate that until we accept you. Um, you know accept that we can't move forward um, so thank you um, thank you very much Duan would like this question because we both loved this report um, the five-year consolidated housing community development plan I just did you find yourself in line with it um, it just globe just you know on a on a macro level without on going a into 
I would say on a macro level, yes. And I believe I tried to, to articulate that in our comments, in, in my uh, comments, which is that, you know, you're hearing from both city staff as well as the citizens that have been asked to come together and offer their advice. Overarchingly, you're hearing the same thing. Right? Isn't, that, isn't that nice? <laughs> well, and I think it underscores, you know, the, the point that, you know, we know what needs to be done. There, there really isn't a, a question about, you know, there's, there's really not, the data will show. This is not a question of need. This is not a question of solutions. This is a, a question of action. Yeah, the, the median um, family income chart was quite alarming. I mean, that's, it, it will take 5.47 times a median salary to afford a house in Annapolis, if I understand that correctly. Yeah. That's I, correct. So I, I, I think that that's due to our skewness of having these multi-million dollar homes and, and versus, so um, did you find that alarming? I did, and also if I can draw the attention to that in the, uh, the prior image that was shown regarding that middle, uh, missing middle, middle housing. So uh, I, I ask any of you, go to Trulia or real estate um, website of your choice check out Washington DC, check out, and what I'm talking about here is the availability of what is for sale. And you'll see that in Washington DC, um, over 80% of everything for sale is a condo. So that's what's causing that affordability. It's more affordable because they're buying condos, right? Problem is we don't have that missing middle housing. It's literally missing here. So essentially what we're saying is that if you cannot afford a single family detached home, because that's what we have a lot of construction of. If you cannot afford a single family detached home, then we don't want you in the city. Okay. And so what we're building is exclusionary white neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Now, we are uh, doing more building of townhouses, but still, we now, when you look at Annapolis, as I, let me juxtapose that to DC. DC, over 80% for sale are condos. In Annapolis, over 80% for sale are single family detached homes. Um, and and uh, actually, sorry, it's maybe 60% single family detached homes and about 25% or 30% are your townhouses, which we have a lot of those also. But if it's not a single family detached home or a townhouse and you can't afford one of those two, we are essentially telling people you're not welcome here. And, and Ellie, to your point, uh, or Alderman, Alderwoman Tierney, to your point, with the five-year consolidated plan, the facts were consistent across the board. And as, um, as Quentin, has st Quentin has stated here, um, he made it simple. The reason that we are seeing these, the uh, cost of housing go through the roof is because there's just not enough. As the five-year consolidated report says, and our report says is, people often ride around and they say, oh, well, there's a lot of public housing and there's a lot of subsidized housing in the city. Why do we have a housing problem? Well, it's to capacity. You have 2,500 families on the uh, wait list for HACA. 51% are extremely low income. 55% are families with children. 85% of those are black families. And so the problem is, is that we're running out of house. And then we create um, additional housing. For example, the uh, uh, housing that's going in on West Street next to Monarch Academy. But there's a caveat with that that allows the developers have gone into an agreement with uh, the Baltimore City Housing Authority. And so they have voucher priority over city of Annapolis residents. And so what happens is, is that we get 45 townhouses and 35 may go to Baltimore City residents and 10 will go to Annapolis residents. And so we are digging ourselves into the problem without creating uh, you know, uh, housing for our residents. And so we have to be at the table in that, going back to your point with reimagining HACA. How does that happening? Us being in the conversation, us working with HACA up front with development and saying, no, let's not give the contract to Baltimore City uh, uh, Housing Authority for their voucher connection. Let's give it to our residents because we need it as well. And so, um, you know, there are just so many, there are layers of issues um, and sometimes, um, you know, complicated inequities uh, that have worked systemically, as they've stated, for decades um, that way. And so what we're working on is trying to prevent our residents from having to leave where they've lived for 30 years to go to Brooklyn Park or go to Glen Burnie or go to Baltimore um, and reside here in the city. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to also bring the attention to the um, uh, lot uh, as the point that Alderman uh, Arnett made. If you look at the screen, the light green areas are the uh, residential um, vacant lots that he was um, uh, mentioning previously, just to give you an idea. Thank you. 
Um, uh, one last thing to kind of piggyback on what Alderman Gay here was saying is uh, regarding the, the uh, affordable housing and then what we are building are a lot of these, you know, uh, exclusionary townhouses and single family homes that are uh, half a million dollars plus is that if we have affordable housing and we keep it creating a situation where there is no step stone to something external to that, we are saying that that is where they are stuck. Right? When we have the missing middle housing, when we don't build duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, or something that facilitates someone to make a socioeconomic jump from affordable housing or from you know, government subsidized housing into something else, we are essentially sticking them into a hole and saying, stay there. Mm -hmm. um, you know what troubles me, and I, I probably should have said this during the comprehensive plan review, it's my last comment, um, is that, you know, we think that you know affordable housing project is is okay because it's out there you know um we have to sprinkle you know we have to work ourselves from outside in we have to sprinkle you know the other wards with affordable housing because i'm just fearful that we're, we're, we're still going to have this segregation if you will oh you live on the outside of town you know we got to look at these opportune sites in ward one and 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 ward eight you know where these expense that's just a, a crit critique um the other thing um it is a huge paradigm shift that you're saying is that instead of haka receiving you know the crumbs if you will of whatever hud is going to or even you know are not giving them the attention from us now the focus is on them and the tools available to leverage um, to leverage what they have and that really empowers them you know accordingly so I, I think that's a huge a huge point that you made and my last question and that I'll be quiet is I'm very interested in, in incorporating affordable housing on on the upper levels of Main Street which might involve uh, apartment rental so I was told I couldn't do, you know, I, I, is there another word for rent control? <laughs> um, but in your point 10, it says, you know, implement limits to rent increases. Is it, I can talk offline to you about that, but I, I, we can't dictate rents. Can well, there was a memo issued by the city attorney's office um, at the outset of the pandemic that issued a cap on rent on rental increases due to the safety and well-being uh, impacts that those increases may have. Uh, during during uh, during the emergency order that is correct but I believe another interpretation of that would be that those same health impacts still exist in light of a COVID impact d despite COVID were you not to have a safe an affordable place to live you still do have a risk to your safety health and well-being and I challenge I would challenge this uh, council uh, to ask any of the public housing residents whether or not that is true. And I, I think you'll find that to be true. And I think you'll find that to be true of any of us. Mm -hmm. The more money that we have to contribute on a daily basis, on a monthly basis to our housing is less money that we are able to contribute into the overall economy. The in investments in affordable housing and housing affordability overall have an economic multiplier effect that is well established. They are tremendous investments that pay dividends back to the public interest. Okay. All right. That's good. I'll be creative with that. Thank you so much for your passion and your work, especially um, to my colleague, Thank Alderman you. Gay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have three questions. Good afternoon. I apologize for being late. Number one, you indicated that there are 500 uh, vacant, I guess, lots or spaces within the city um, that are potential um, affordable housing. Did you break that down by ward? That's my first question. So if you um, I, I look here again at the map, I'll zoom in for you so you can see Ward 3. Um, any of the light green areas that Quentin uh, went through are zoned residential and uh, are you know eligible for, re or for development. And so if you can see here, it's just mm -hmm. a little blurry. And again, this has been emailed to you, this uh, needs assessment report. Um, and so here are the uh, eligible areas in Ward 3. Uh, do you have a number? So uh, I can get you a number per per ward if that's what you're asking. Yes, I would but like not to see break that. it down per ward. But what you do have here is again that almost 500 uh, vacant parcels that, um, according to the tax assessed records, which I assume are accurate, 
um, that there's zero uh, improved value on those parcels. So I will uh, like to also point out some nuance within the data set, obviously, is that um, one, this was not, uh, you know, it's not explicitly saying that this is explicitly for, um, for uh, subsidized housing or something like this, but this is part of the strategies that we have lined out that these are available that we see. Now, um, the other thing is that you do have rather large parcels there that are not broken down. So there's, this is a, that's something to note is that while it's approximately uh, 500 vacant parcels that are already zoned residential, that they make up um, a little bit about 176 acres total. Do you, are you aware of uh, the upcoming parole place in War Three? Are you aware of that development? So I've heard of it, but I'm, uh, I don't know to what extent. How would that impact your numbers or <clears throat> what you're attempting to do? Would that be rolled into that, those numbers in Ward 3? When you refer to the parole development, which... Parole place on the corner of Forest and Old Solomon's Island. I'm not familiar yet with the project. I don't yeah, really that's in the pipeline. Uh, and, so, uh, unless it's, uh, I've been explained it to it under a different name, I'm not yet familiar that's with it. What it's, that's the last name that I heard for okay. it. So that would be uh, another question of mine as far as, has that been considered in your report? It, it sounds like it has not been. Uh, no, ma'am. So yeah, the, uh, for the needs assessment report, which is the needs assessment committee I chaired, and it was rather uh, gathering all this data mm -hmm. available so that the other, uh, the other committees could then take that and make their recommendations. So uh, in terms of the needs assessment report, it's only showing what was available at the time that we did the, the study which took place mostly last fall. Did you take a look at what planning and zoning, because they give out a report every month uh, as to what's in the pipeline, was that considered, though? because parole place is in there as well as town courts? Sh sure, so I mean, we saw this, but I guess I'm not understanding to what, like, um, when, I'm not understanding, I guess, the, the end to the question. The question is, the ones that are in the pipeline that planning and zoning provides to us Month, a monthly report. Have any of those projects, were they considered in your report? Because that is kind of a rolling um, uh, list of, of uh, it might be about 20 now, but they're all over the city. And I didn't know if you had taken those, that list and looked at that list. Sure. It, so so ma'am, my report uh, regarding the needs assessment, uh, when it comes to this, simply took a look. Uh, when we pulled the data set at the time of pulling the data set, it was what was the tax assessor was listing as vacant at the time that they did their report. Okay, um, so it would not have been, that list would not have been a part of that. Correct. Right. So yeah, it, it would have been included in this map, but the because it, the project is not officially um, out of the permitting process, it would not have been included as a development. Uh, but we did, uh, one of the very first things that we did was take the data from planning and zoning that they uh, Sally sends out or direct announcements out on, on a monthly basis and just really try to pinpoint and look at again what uh, developments are uh, in the works and w how we can you know piggyback off of that in particularly any of the ones that were focused on affordable housing um, and any of the ones that were um, in areas that we felt were um, I guess development ready particularly amongst the forest drive corridor um, and, and the Tyler um, uh, Tyler Avenue corridor as well. Okay, because it looks like it's mainly impacting War 3, so that's why I'm very concerned about it. And we've had these conversations before. Um, my second question is you indicated that citizens have been asked about, um, I guess, how they, I guess, somewhat of a loose survey. Um, do you have a breakdown of wards as to how many people in each ward you had surveyed? So, yeah, so if you take a look, yes, ma'am, if you take a look uh, towards the bottom, uh, third of the needs assessment report. And again, the needs assessment report was emailed uh, maybe January, February, and then I guess last night as well. So you don't have a physical copy because it is about 90 pages, but there's there was a survey that was sent out. It was posted on social media. It was sent out in emails. It was asked by many people to, to, to take it. It was taken, it was made in both English and in Spanish in order to ensure that we had max participation from our residents. And uh, then right there you have, so. Uh, you see that some wards obviously had more more participation than others, but all of that and it's a uh, it's a substantial part of that needs assessment report. Uh, what questions were asked? The charts and graphs showing uh, the breakdown of, of of wards, 
breakdown of answers. So it is a substantial part. And I, I would uh, ask that people take a look at that report to really get an understanding. And what I will also point out is the colors that you see there. Um, I believe the blue represent English speakers mm -hmm. and the uh, red represent the uh, Spanish speakers. Excuse me, is there any way to enlarge that? Is there any way to enlarge that? So yes, I can, I can zoom in for you. As you see, the most um, responsive word okay, uh, was, was eight, followed by, uh, one second, eight, followed by one, followed by five, six, three, and four. Okay. And the reason I'm asking is because the, the green and the other chart really focuses on Ward 3, but there's very little feedback from Ward 3. Um, and I don't know how you, uh, you indicated just now how the survey went out, but I, I would suggest that you um, meet with the Greater Parole Community Association. They have a monthly meeting and um, we have close to well, about 450 members. And so every meeting is usually about 50 people. And I think it would be a good idea if you could present what you've got here to them that might generate some, some discussion. I do believe it will. No, I know it will generate some more discussion. So I'm going to put that on the list. And, 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 um, and there were members from uh, Ward 3 that served. I'm not sure if you heard the names in the beginning that served on the task force as well. Um, I believe it was Sherry Lynn Hutton. Mm -hmm. And she's on the Greater Parole Community Association's executive leadership team. But I think it would uh, behoove you to, to talk with the president as well as the executive leadership team. It's about 10 on that group. But I can arrange that if you give me your, your contact information, and we can certainly do that. Because I think, you know, oftentimes certain communities don't necessarily respond. It looks like Ward 4 as well, and Alderman Finlayson represents that ward. So I think it would be a great idea if you did a little more digging and a little more talking, you know, some some areas are, are much more uh, inclined to respond and they may not be the ones that are actually impacted. But I think it would be very good if, if you talk to them as well. So I can arrange that meeting for you. Yes, ma'am. And, and my last question is, and Alderman Gay indicated that um, about the vouchers. Now, I've been on the ground level for town courts. I've never gotten that information. Alderman Gay, is there someone that I should speak with about um, the voucher program and how the, sounds like the Baltimore City residents are getting um, more of a, a, a head start, a heads up, because I've had uh, quite a few residents in the city of Annapolis who have asked about town courts, but I would like to have a contact information do you have something readily available? Yeah, I, I definitely would suggest um, reaching out to the developers and the uh, uh, crew that they've hired to manage the application process. You it's have been a name? no. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll get that to you. I don't okay. know if I should put it on. It's been um, a, a difficult um, process, as you know. There are well over a thousand a uh, applications, right. first come, first serve basis. Um, and I've spoken to uh, some members from. Uh, organizations within the county, ACDS, um, and a number of other organizations that work with, um, you know, families trying to provide affordable housing, and that is what the developer, uh, developers and property management have stated. Uh, there had been a, a process um, at, at the uh, point of permitting and developing uh, where they had to go into um, uh, some sort of contract with the uh, vouchers, and unfortunately, I'm not sure what happened. But Hacker was not there. And so that contract was made with the uh, Baltimore City Housing Authority uh, where they would get priority for voucher. Uh, Do you have something in writing that I could take a look at? I can get it for you, yeah. Yeah, that would be great because I'm gonna have to take that back to the Greater Parole Community Association as well. Dr. Nash, do you are you familiar with, with that information? Have you been contacted as well, or Ms. Wellman? I didn't know if, if from the city side, I know Alderman Gay from the council side, but anything from the city side. So the way I don't understand is, oh, I'm sorry, Teresa Wellman, planning and zoning. Um, the way I understand is a um, developer can, um, um, can apply to the Baltimore Metropolitan Council who will get vouchers from HUD and the way it works is all the different housing authorities are allowed to put their vouchers in and give vouchers. So if Baltimore City puts in five vouchers, then the people that get chosen to have the vouchers come off the Baltimore City Housing Authority list. 
Does that okay. make sense? It was my understanding that City of Annapolis Housing Authority had 14 vouchers. Okay. So it's a whole pool. Okay. So uh, 14 for the City of Annapolis because I think it's 42 units. Uh, five for Baltimore City. Do you have any? Other? I can get that information from the Baltimore Metropolitan Council. That would be great. I would like to see that because I think that's very, very important. Thank you, Alderman right. Gay, for letting us know. No, it um, did come up as an issue, and I did call. Okay, I never heard about it. I wish I had. <laughs> since it's in my ward and I've been in it from the ground level that would have been good <laughs> for me to know right, right. but it better late up. than never so um, I'm just trying to find out if, if there's, there can be some adjustments made at this point with the voucher system that we can get more of Annapolis residents involved yeah if we can get more vouchers from the housing Great. authority wonderful so I can contact the housing authority wonderful and find out can you do that sure. at your very earliest convenience yes, I would appreciate I that thank you so much <laughs> Not a problem. All right. This is wonderful. Thank you. And I'm glad I, I made it. I wasn't quite sure, but I, 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 want, I know how important this is to Alderman Gay. So I thought I'd make sure I got here. Well, thank, thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. um, just Ross, before you, add, or Alderman Arnett, before you ask your question, I wanted to um, um, allow John the opportunity to expand a, a little more on the uh, land trust question that you had at the beginning. He has experience working in this. Hi, thanks. Uh, Mike Pitchford, I was on the uh, Feasibility Task Force uh, subcommittee. Um, I, I uh, had the pleasure of doing an Urban Land Institute um, Advisory Services uh, uh, panel on the island of Maui. Somebody had to do it. <laughs> um, and uh, Maui had, at that point, had a tremendous affordability issue. They had an average price of about a million for the homes and an average uh, income of about 40,000. And as it turned out, Maui had really all the tools that you could think of and stuff that are in the recommendations here, um, and they weren't using them well. For example, you, had a, you have the trust fund. They had a trust fund. We have one. It's not being used well. It could be used much better. We've talked about that. But they did have a uh, housing trust, which worked very, very well. And they would basically sweep up all of the available land that they could, maybe buy something on the cheap, uh, do whatever, pick it up in a variety of ways, and then hold it and pay attention to their comp plans. And then they would work very carefully to get it to developers, get it out the, the door, uh, lease it, uh, as well as sell it, so they could do long-term control of the affordability. And it was one of the best tools that they were using. So it, it has, um, and there's plenty of places, actually, if you had a redevelopment authority, it could work similar to that. Um, and, and Virginia has some very good redevelopment authorities, but it's a, it's a powerful tool if you can get it right. Well, Lynette? So, yeah, <laughs> thank you, I'm glad you, came up. So that means there's probably already <clears throat> on the table model legislation that we could be looking at. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. You so do not would... have to create this from scratch. Okay. All right. That would be very helpful. So, um, the, I've, Dawn, I've gotten a couple of text messages from constituents. Are all of these documents online so they can pull them up? Yeah, of course. Um, so they have not yet been made publicly available. This is the first time that um, we have done so. Outside of um, some uh, communications with you know the the uh, Eastport uh, tenant and Harbor Eastport Harbor House Senate Association and small groups like that. Okay, I think um, there's interest. So the sooner we can get it up and people can get it in their hands, that would be good. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I'll try to work with. Um, MIT to add it to the city website in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. In a in a very conspicuous button because sometimes it's hard to find things, <laughs> even for people on the council. Thank attorney. You. Um, just so that we're all on the same wavelength, do you see that form based zoning is conducive to introducing more uh, workforce housing? Have you talked to Eric about that? <laughs> The, I mean, in other words, we'll need some zoning changes, don't you think? Yes, I think, yeah, go ahead. We definitely will, and I think you've heard that from the, that, that acknowledgement um, from city staff as well. I, I, I would also offer that, you know, I think we're, we're touching on a number of things that really do need to kind of be 
very intentionally integrated in together. So, you know, we, we're talking about the, the um, trust fund, but also the city trust, right? And so those two mechanisms need to be brought together. We also need to be tapping into additional uh, funding streams and looking at, at how we can leverage the city's uh, capabilities from a financing uh, as a financing partner, um, and then and then there is the issue of actual uh, zoning changes to allow across the spectrum from ADUs as we've been talking about to tiny homes as has been mentioned to overall d denser development. I think we are beginning to see this acknowledgement of reuse of of. Uh, uh, re redoing, rezoning uh, land use policy across the country, because as Quentin has pointed out, it is, um, if not intentional, it has the the effect of being exclusionary and of being discriminatory, mm -hmm. and and that is that in the past has been intentional, mm -hmm. um, and now whether or not it is intentional, it does have that effect. And so we need to be equally intentional and equally working to affirmatively advance fair housing, the, the fair housing principles yeah, uh, look, that are out there. And that is to allow denser development. Right. I look at it mathematically. I mean, we're incredibly skewed. Um, so thank you so much. And I just wanted to expand on um, the trust really quickly, as we, in particularly the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, which also came up during the budget process. And the goal in this and what we will now have to uh, go back and do um, is revise the legislation that we just passed, uh, but bring back the housing affordability, um, uh, the housing affordability trust fund uh, with the same exact uh, measures that it was set up with uh, previously. Uh, unfortunately, the housing affordability trust fund, and Teresa can expand on this, is, is funded through the, the, ex, yeah, the fee in lieu, uh, which is very slim. Um, and so what we did was working with the state legislature, obviously, um, is uh, worked on the affordable housing trust fund, which would be funded 3% uh, uh, annually out of the uh, hotel tax that the city would uh, receive. And so uh, the two uh, would stand separately. The home ownership assistance trust fund, as I mentioned previously, would go back to doing what its purpose is to assist with closing and opening costs on houses, assist with um, uh, housing uh, development projects, as Teresa has done a really good job with in the Clay Street Corridor and, and things like that. While the housing uh, affordability trust fund would focus solely on this middle housing that we've discussed uh, today and using that uh, 60 plus uh, something thousand dollars a year to help with uh, security deposits, to help with lease agreements, to help with uh, paying back rents to, uh, so that people can get into uh, more affordable housing. Uh, these are just all, all things that really have held us up. Um, and the, the success of that can also be found in uh, the uh, city of Pittsburgh's affordable housing tr uh, uh, plan, which is we di uh, directly copied uh, the uh, metrics that they set up um, in the city of Pittsburgh um, and how they uh, formed their task force. And we just replicated it here using our data um, and the resources that we had. So it can be successful. It's working for them. Their housing stock is booming. I've been in touch with uh, their Department of Zoning uh, is what it's called there. Um, and so, as mentioned, it can be extremely effective if we put uh, the right time and energy and investment into these projects. One minute. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ooh. So you won't believe the number of text messages I'm getting. <laughs> this has sparked a lot of interest. Um, one of the questions, and, and I think obviously this isn't the right setting to do this because this gets into nitty gritty, but one of the questions is bringing up the whole issue of squaring density with environmental impacts. So that's another thing that I think needs to be uh, put into the 10 point plan. And then another question is, um, do we think that we should be trying, because of some of these issues about Baltimore getting um, some of our vouchers and things like that, should we be trying to merge our housing authority with at least the county, if not make it even broader? And, and I will add to that, the amounts of money we're talking about, I remember when you gave us the thing about um, helping with vouchers for affordable housing, which is something I certainly do support because I think that's a non-market intervention. But really, the 3% is chump change. And we're talking about lots of money here. 
buying land and holding it is an expensive proposition. Have you done any ballpark analysis of the order of magnitude that we're talking about to really have anything close to a meaningful program? Thank you very much for those questions. So uh, as an environmentalist myself, I'm a certified floodplain manager. I work in the environmental uh, spectrum. The uh, one thing to point out is that single family detached homes uh, is not the environmental answer. So, well, sure, absolutely. But you can also do that in the context of, of what we're deeming this miss, missing middle housing. So uh, Alderwoman Tierney brought up the form, form based uh, design and and zoning as well. So the author of that book actually talks specifically to that concern. And when we're talking about middle, missing middle housing, we're actually talking about structures that are the same size uh, when we're talking about this form-based uh, design, right? So form-based design, form-based uh, zoning, the context of what we're talking about are not these large scale structures. But when we are talking about, we're talking about something that is of the same form factor of a single family detached home, only that instead of doing that, you still just have it separated down into a duplex or a triplex or a quadplex. We have examples in this town. We have examples throughout the entire country. This is actually very prominent throughout the United States 50, 75, 100 years ago. But it wasn't until really zoning came along in the last 50 to 75 years that zoning practice actually increased people being spread out through single family detached homes and the environmental impact of that has not actually been better it's been worse so when we do think about middle dense construction we should still think about something that is essentially the size the same form of a single family detached home so imagine those throughout your neighborhood they fit in terms of uh, the characteristics of the homes around it, only it just might be a duplex or a triplex. But so it's, it's still a very, very fundamental uh, that the context of it is still environmental and the impacts is actually less than, than building a uh, single family detached homes and spreading it wide and having this urban growth that just expands and cuts down trees more. And that environmental impact is actually way worse. So Minneapolis, changed their zoning, got rid of single family, you can go up to a quadruplex. I think that was like 2017 or something like that. Do we have any results back from that, uh, that zoning change? So I, I don't know that specific one, but I can tell you that there are uh, communities throughout the entire country that have done this and it's uh, for a lot longer than 2017 and uh, report back very positive things. So I can, what I can do is the same picture that was shown about that middle, missing middle housing, I will get you all the book and the author and as well as some YouTube videos where he talks about this. And he shows many situations throughout the country where this has been prominent and successful. It allows for more, uh, more businesses downtown because you're actually utilizing space in a, in a more efficient manner. Alderman, I actually uh, have written down right here, Minneapolis ban on single family housing. And that was very much what I wanted to bring up. I actually, uh, a colleague of mine is the commissioner of the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. Um, or I'm sorry, yes, Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, mm -hmm. Jennifer Ho. She was a former senior advisor to HUD in the previous administration, in the Obama administration. Um, and I worked very closely with her and what I can and I currently work with, uh, uh, with a colleague of hers uh, now for the state of Virginia. And what we can say as a result of that uh, um, overarching um, change in zoning is that it has not been done in isolation. What has also been done is the implementation of a myriad of other mechanisms to again do exactly what we are talking about, to look at this issue in a time frame wise across what's short, middle, and long term and bring over recognizing that the change to the overall zoning has to be complemented with trusts, with a trust fund, with these other bonding mechanisms, and, and the allowability of, of denser development all the way down to ADUs and tiny homes. And that progress 
It hasn't changed, it hasn't bent the affordability curve in an overarching manner quite yet. But again, as I stated, it took us decades to get here. It's gonna take us decades of being equally intentional. And that is a first big step in that direction. Uh, so it is something that I would strongly encourage the city to consider. Okay, so that, I mean, real life uh, results are the things that help us understand you know, the whole time, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm thinking about the reaction, and I'd love to know what happened. Minneapolis has some beautiful old Victorian homes, wonderful neighborhoods, Chicago suburbs, and so forth, and they're um, enjoyed by people of means. And we're talking about displacing those people of means. I, I, how did that, So I'm wondering how what happened in Minneapolis. I've seen pictures of big Victorian Queen Anne style and a quadruplex right next to it. And I, in the words community character, we hear that a lot, come up all the time. So uh, how, how does it go down with the actual citizens that are, are experiencing this? Alderman, as uh, the, my colleague has mentioned, um, there are various forms of, of, of density, as he explained. When you think of, uh, uh, I'll use this as an example. Um, when I first came into this role and we would have our back and forth as it related to density and zoning changes, I was not sure why you were so opposed to it. And then I went to Houston, Texas, and I've seen where you walk out your front door, there's a skyscraper across from a single family home. And I'm like, ah, that's why, you know, uh, maintaining zoning is so critical and maintaining, maintaining community character is critical as which you've touched on. And I know it's a concern of, uh, the residents of Ward 8. And so as he's mentioned, you don't need a skyscraper to create density. You can do so in the forms of a duplex, triplex, all that would stay within um, uh, 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 the scope of the uh, the community character. Example, Wells, uh, Wells um, Street here in Annapolis, Maryland, as we discussed, there are three duplexes or two um, one of them is a triplex on that um, uh, road. It stays within the context of the community character to the point that you drive by and think it's a single family home that's just built up. Um, and so there are various ways to get around the fears, uh, understandably so, of, of citizens who believe that uh, their neighborhoods would drastically change. Uh, when, when it's that, that's just not the case. It can be in a much larger urban environment. Uh, but when you're talking about an area uh, like the city of Annapolis, as he mentioned, it would just take um, the, the appropriate changes and follow through from staff and council to ensure that uh, our zoning is in line with what our community would like to see. Well, I, I'd just like to there. say uh, I appreciate the questions from you and the questions from your phone. Um, we will, I will personally, along with I'm sure my colleagues, we will go research Minneapolis for you and we will come back with data. Yep. I appreciate that. And I think we're going to need that, to be honest. I mean, this is going to have to be sold to the people who vote us into or out of office. And uh, they'll feel threatened by it. I, they already are feeling threatened by it. So um, we need to be able to have the empirical information that actually shows what happens with these transformations. Did they keep the Victorians? Yeah. And, and it's yeah. interesting Sorry. you mentioned uh, Wells Avenue because I, ironically enough, some of us were at a party there over the weekend by Will Rouse House, and the, the biggest house on the block isn't the duplex. It's a brand new single family, three story, essentially three story house. So um, I, I take your point on it doesn't have to be a skyscraper. Alderman, I just would, I, I, I do understand the political nature that you're talking about. Um, I've had the, uh, the, the opportunity to, to work at the National League of Cities for seven years, working exclusively on housing and, and visited communities across the country to talk about these exact type of issues. So I certainly can appreciate the political dimensions of it. What I will also offer though, is that there is wide, widespread misunderstanding of the fundamentals of housing. And the notion, I, I think the first thing that I offer is that if you ask people where the majority of the federal government's money that goes to support housing goes, people are gonna say it goes to support affordable housing, that it goes to public housing, that it goes to vouchers. That's not true. 
the majority of the money that we spend as a country on housing goes to subsidize people like me who own a single family home and deduct mor the mortgage interest deduction. And that has been changed as a result of the tax legislation that was passed a few years ago by the previous administration. Yes, it reduced, it changed the overall standard deduction, but it also increased the amount that you can deduct on your mortgage. And so as a result of these fundamental misunderstandings of housing policy, myths about housing are able to be perpetuated. And so I certainly recognize the need to educate the public, but I would also offer that it takes bold leadership to enact known, tried and true <clears throat> mechanisms that can make an impact in our community. I, I agree with you, but there's also the fundamentals of the market. Um, the housing in Annapolis in a lot of places is what it is, not because of terrible older persons or even bad code, it's because of supply and demand and what people want. And so I think we're gonna have to talk about how we're addressing those sort of incentives or disincentives. I appreciate the recognition that there is a fundamental mismatch of supply and demand. I will also offer that, for example, the mortgage interest deduction is a primary skewer of the market because it, it inserts perverse incentives that encourage the building of single family detached homes that are bigger and bigger and bigger. So the notion that, mar that the market is, is the cause of this exclusively, I think operates without the overall, overall context that there are policy uh, elements in place that encourage market distortions that favor one side of the market at the disadvantage of another. Honorable Pindell Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A uh, couple of things, and Alderman uh, um, Arnett brought up one thing that I want to stress about the voucher program because we have had many city residents who have had to move to Glen Burnie, to Brooklyn, to Baltimore, and have expressed to us that they would like to come back. So I would definitely agree that we could possibly expand it, uh, Ms. Wellman, to include Anne Arundel County, if that's a possibility. We definitely want to look at our own residents, but there are some who would really like to come back and live in the city, and I think this would be a great opportunity. The other thing I want to mention, um, and Alderman, uh, Arnett brought up uh, uh, the word threatened. And I think in Ward 3 is much different than Ward 8. I would say Ward 3 is probably 45% uh, African American. I'm, I'm roughly 30% Hispanic, 25% white. The um, African American community started uh, this um, community back right after the Civil War. That's how I got its name of parole. and. Um, and so uh, for different reasons than possibly Ward 8, uh, Ward 3 is pr pretty affordable. It's probably the most affordable ward in the city. And so uh, uh, people, uh, like anything, uh, change is hard. Uh, and that's why I would like for you to meet with the Greater Parole Community Association. And part of the, the trepidation is um, traffic. If you... Um, have done any research, we border right on Anne Arundel County line. So whatever Anne Arundel County does, we really technically have no control over what they build, whether it's the town center, whether it's Mavis, uh, whatever it is there, we're kind of stuck with it. And so we've had uh, on West Street on 450, uh, prior to the traffic signal being installed at West and Gibraltar about a year ago, that um, we were having an accident every day. We've had too many fatalities. So traffic is, is extremely important in my ward. And I don't know if there was any kind of study or looked at the Upper West Street sector study or whatever you've looked at to look at Ward 3. And, and really, our kind of we're at the mercy of the county and what they do. And that's a lot of the trepidation as far as Ward 3 is concerned when it comes to um, um, uh, this, this proposal. Just really quickly, um, older women, with the voucher program um, and the way it was explained to me, because I too have, you know, so many residents that are either wanting to use their voucher to come back to the city of Annapolis or get a voucher to, um, you know, find housing within the city. And so part of the problem is, one, is that HUD is the uh, manufacturer of the vouchers and is paid... Uh, 
in a complex process. Teresa, if you could, um, because the way Melissa explains it obviously is much better. She is more <laughs> works in this field. Uh, but they assign the amount of vouchers uh, that um, uh, these. Uh, in, it, well, it goes from big, uh, big, big HUD to uh, regional HUD, and they decide and dictate how many vouchers we get. Um, and so part of that process is, is unfortunately not on our, our hands uh, as it relates to the voucher. But then, uh, as, as you mentioned, Ward 3, I just wanted to, again, turn your guys' attention to the needs assessment report. Um, Quentin did a really good job of just finding some population trends and key indicators in each ward. And so, as we can see here, just based off of his uh, results, Ward 3 is the third, it'll be the third uh, most affordable uh, ward within the city of Annapolis. The first being uh, Ward 6 in regards to housing price, the second being four, and then the third being uh, four, uh, uh, war three. Not a surprise, yeah, thank you. Um, so that's part of, of what war three's um, expressed trepidation is regarding the proposal. Like I said, it's, a, in a, it's an old ward. Uh, many of the families have been there, including mine, since the Civil War. So um, like I said, change is difficult, um, but we have to look at what the county is doing. We have to consider because we do not have any control over what the county builds right on our border. And so the traffic issue has been a major concern for years. Um, we tried for 20 years to get that traffic signal and we finally got it last year. Mm -hmm. And it took some pulling and tugging and some money to get it installed, but finally we got it. And so it, it you know, I, I say to folks, you know, Ward 3, we, we got stuff we didn't want and stuff we wanted we couldn't get. And so that's kind of, the, I guess it's really the, the story of many traditional African-American communities. And so we, we've ended up paying the price for things uh, that were not requested and things that were requested did not come. So I, I wanna, in, in view of, of representing my residents, I must be very blunt about the entire situation. And Alderman Gay and I've had many conversations about, about this as well. And just to, uh, again, add as it relates to concerns of, of residents with old, overdevelopment in particular wards, it, it, looking at the stats, uh, Alderwoman Finlayson actually has the most developable land and she has the most development in the last decade. And so the, there are myths truly as it relates to uh, housing development in particular wards. It's just not true. Uh, if anything, uh, it, it, uh, hers would be the most impacted over the last decade. And again, these uh, facts and findings are all here within the um, uh, needs assessment report. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Wellman, I, I'd still like for you to follow up with that with that voucher because if, if we can get just one more, uh, hopefully we can get more than one, but that would help tremendously with whatever family and families can possibly come back. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Alderman Tierney? Yeah, I think um, we're equating this to new development, um, which, would, you know, it's all about messaging, and, and we're really talking about integration and not, you know, new. It doesn't necessarily have to be new development, and, and that's, but I, I, I don't know. I'm trying to read, but. I'm trying to read between, I, I don't, I respect my, my colleague, I'm, I'm trying to read between the lines of what Alderwoman Pindle Charles is saying. I don't know if it's a fear of new development, is that, I don't want to cross talk, but anyway, do you know what I'm trying to say? It's more, the messaging is we want more integration of, 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 of housing, uh, you, know, mi you know, the missing middle, not these high rise, you know. Yes, yes. Um, and I believe Elijah stated it probably better than I can and probably better than I will. But it's a multifaceted approach. And to the point that we've kind of been dancing around that I don't think has been stated just right. yet is the first step is redefi uh, redefining what affordable housing means, who it helps. And I don't think we probably should have opened up with that. But Affordable housing isn't always a single mother of four. It's your local police. Their average salary is around sixty-five to sixty-eight thousand dollars, and your average salary in Annapolis is mid-eighties. Is that correct, Quinn? That is, yeah. Um, so that constitutes affordable housing. That police officer, man or woman, needs affordable housing. Teachers need affordable housing. Yeah. Anne Arundel Medical Center. Everybody that works there 
needs affordable housing. And that's why they were so important in this conversation. And I think, to your point, I think, you know, you're, you're the residents of your ward, the first step is letting them know affordable housing isn't, isn't what I'm sure most people envision. Affordable housing, like we said, is, you know, your everyday worker, your police officers, your teachers, your first responders. And if we can understand that, I think that opens up the floor to much broader conversations and people are more willingly willing to allow, you know, these duplexes, these triplexes, um, these quadplexes, and they'll understand that, no, it won't sacrifice the integrity of their community or the character of their community. Oftentimes we hear that, that phrase, um, but it will only help the community. I mean, you don't know what your neighbor makes. You don't know if your neighbor is, a, is, is an affordable housing resident. And quite honestly, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah, and, and one of the prongs is also, you know, evaluating existing, you know, inventory and trying to optimize it, um, you know, in lieu of new development and making these properties affordable. Because that, that was one point of the, of the consolidation plan is that we, we may have the dwellings, but they're not affordable. Um, so, yeah, a couple comments, I guess, here. Um, I think that we, we have to start off with the perspective that change is normal and natural. It happens. Um, whether it develops in a haphazard manner or we put our arms around it and try to manage it in into a fashion that we drive Annapolis into what we hope Annapolis will be in the future. Um, but the idea that the Annapolis of the past has to be the Annapolis of the future, um, that's just not reality, right? Things change. This is normal and natural. Now we want to manage it so that we keep the characteristics of what we love about this city. And we totally get that. And we totally understand that. Um, so there is fear and trepidation. We completely understand that. But if we continue the way that the track is now, that things are being built to half a million dollars or more, um, yet the incomes are not matching that. It's going to become less and less affordable um, unless something is done. Now, every solution is going to have some issues and they have to be managed and worked with. But just saying, you know, um, hey, we're afraid of this because this will happen and, and, and not managing that, right? All you're saying is that when we keep the status quo, and the status quo is you're still going to have development to about 65 units per, per year. Um, you're still going to have people trying to move in and around this area. And just because they don't move into the city of Annapolis doesn't mean that it doesn't influence the roads or the traffic or something like this, right? Um, you're still going to have these changes. So it's good to manage and understand that, uh, as some of the numbers point out here, we have to manage for a growing population. It's not growing at a huge pace, but it's still growing at a rate that we're building only half to match, meaning that supply and demand is not in flux, right? So we're not in flux with supply and demand. The, we, the supply side of that equation is, is vastly under being developed, right? While the demand is, is only growing. So that's going to cause those rates to continue. Um, it's going to become less affordable. Um, I do ask that people take a look at the numbers in the report. I, I welcome people. We'll make it public, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, we have a paradox. And the paradox is that we must develop more in order to keep up with the demand. However, if we develop more, then we run out of land. And it also skyrockets the, the, uh, in terms of affordability, it becomes less affordable. So either one of those scenarios, it becomes a less affordable community if we don't manage in a way that we account for that population and that increase. So it is a paradox. I do have it on page five here of the, um, of the executive summary here, right? That, um, and this, these are numbers that might blow people's mind away here, but if we are assuming that the tax assessor's numbers are correct, that the tax assessors say that we have 176 available acres and we develop single family detached homes that uh, if we develop it at the rate that we're currently developing it as uh, the numbers came from Dr. Nash, then the city will run out of parcels in 18 years. Right. It, parcels, land, vacant land that is zoned for residential. Say again. We have available parcels now. I didn't think we did. Yeah. Under. Well, the, those. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, yeah, the ones that were green. So, know that those are vacant lands according to the tax assessment records. And it's saying that the city, if we were to develop just single family detached homes on those, we run out of land in 18 years. If we develop town and row houses, then we develop 
uh, according to, again, uh, Dr. Nash's numbers of what is averaging development, the city runs out of vacant land zone for residential in 60 years, six zero years. Um, so we have to understand that the city is going in that direction already. It's just, do we want to do it in a better manner so that we don't run out of land? And so we don't have to convert park space into residential. We don't have to redevelop in a, in, in, in a way that we don't want to do. But the numbers are very clear according to the development of what is happening currently, um, plus the, the limited number of vacant parcels. So it's happening. And I don't want to, and that's, so that's what someone should be fearful of, in my opinion, is the idea that this town's running out of land. And if we develop the way that we continue to develop, it's going to run out of land faster. I just would offer, you know, Okay, I, I, I'd offer that. I've worked on this issue for more than 20 years. It is a complicated issue. And, you know, Quentin just really summarized some of the unique elements that are, are true here in Annapolis. And I think when, when we talk with the, with, with the general public about this, one of the first points that I wanted to make as, as, part, as a member of the task force was, that we need to be thinking about this not as a conversation about affordable housing, but as a conversation about housing affordability. And that was why the name change of this task force. This task force was renamed the Housing Affordability Task Force. And when you begin to change that language just by inverting those two words, you allow this ability to broaden the conversation because it does impact every aspect of this community. There is no single solution that is, and there are no even series of solutions that are gonna writ large solve this problem. What we need to be doing is intentionally enacting policies that give us a longer runway to start figuring out other alternatives. And that's exactly what we're trying to prove right here. And in order to get that community buy-in, there is a simple, mathematical uh, mathematical calculation. The cost of your housing should not exceed 35% of your income on a monthly basis. Ask any person to do that in their own minds and then ask themselves after doing that internal calculation whether or not they are a part of the population that is a part of the crisis of housing affordability and I think you will see that it is a vast majority of our community. Thank you. And we are past five o'clock. Alderman one Pindell comment. Charles wanted to talk. Yeah, just one comment. Uh, I'll bring up something that Alderman Arnett said about community character, which was embedded in our 2009 comp plan. And my understanding is we'll be in the next comp plan we do every 10 years. But the one before that, 1998, was the source of the troubles that occurred in Ward 3. Um, there were a lot of mistakes made as a result of that 1998 comp plan. And they tried to correct it in the 2009 comp plan with the community character designation. We in Ward 3, we've had, since I've been on the council the past seven and a half years, we've had 15 developments, not housing necessarily, but business even. And we follow a 10 point plan. We're very strategic in looking at the plan and meeting with developers and meeting with folks who are, who are part of that as far as going down the list and saying, has this been covered? And Dr. Nash knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's a template and a protocol that we follow. And so that's gonna drive whatever you do. Um, and I can only speak for Ward 3, I can't speak for any other wards. So just to kind of give you kind of a, a, a overview on how we kind of, kind of uh, work that. But thank you so much again. And I, and I want to thank you, Alderman Finlayson. Yes, I'm not, I just have a question about the next steps. I did have some questions, but I'll, I'll wait until whatever the next step is. So is this report going to come to the full council? Or is it going to come to committees? What's the next step? Well, the next steps are, are that we work with the um, Housing and Community Equity Development uh, 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 Committee uh, to put together uh, what we believe would be the best uh, legislative approach to solve the issues that we've laid out. Um, and so uh, it will, may be in several different pieces, obviously based off of topic, uh, but working together with the uh, standing committees as well um, and the individual staff. Um, as mentioned, the resolution states um, that the council would um, follow up on the recommendations within 30 days of uh, the report to the full council. And so that would put us um, at 7 17 uh, 21. And so uh, we, we plan to work, uh, hit the ground running, um, and, and work immediately. So could we get a copy of the entire report electronically? 
Yeah, yeah, so I sent that to you guys uh, beforehand. It was in a forward, so it would have been from uh, Eric's email, and it'll have uh, the needs assessment report, the um, executive summary, and the uh, feasibility report. Okay, thank you. I'll hold my questions until the next step, Mr. Mayor. Um, so thank you so much. I, I do want to just ask one quick question. You don't have to answer it. It's something we can talk about offline, but you know, we have uh, of our most vulnerable population, uh, around 600 um, hacker units left after you take Newtown out and Newtown's rebuilt. Like, I hope and I love it that you've established a relationship. This process has been a great process to bring us closer to hacker and really communicate on a daily basis for everybody. But, you know, when you talk to Melissa about the possibility of redevelopment, she, she, she'll she tell you it takes a long time, right? And I don't think those residents have a long time. So I hope we've found some other ways uh, to fast track that because I think the opportunities are great there. So uh, I really appreciate all the hard work that you guys have done. I know um, uh, we're going to do great things together. Um, so, um, and I know you've given hours and hours of your life and taken away from your families to do this. So we truly appreciate this. And this isn't a council that just talks. This is a council that does stuff. We're not going to put a study on the shelf. We're going to move towards a, a, an action committee. And, and we're going to make sure that the actions come out of all your hard work. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, anything else for good order? Order and pen. I move that we adjourn. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. OK, meeting adjourned. Thank you again.